I'm really happy to have with us right now Dr. Dale Peterson, who's taken uh, some of his valuable time to share some very important information with us. So thank you very much for being with us. Great to be here. Um, so uh, first of all, I just think it'd be nice for everybody to know you're a doctor by profession. Um, if you could just tell us, you know, what area you practice in and what you do, that would be wonderful. Well, I'm a problem solver. Most of the people who come to me come to me because they have challenges they haven't been able to find answers to. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, I've learned that what I was taught in medical school, which was diagnose and prescribe medications, doesn't really solve problems. It covers up symptoms, but symptoms are the body's warning lights, like the lights on a car dashboard. If we cover them up, things are only going to get worse over time. So for the last 20 to 25 years, I've really been exploring ways to help people recover from whatever challenges they're facing. And initially began in a more of a nutritional fashion, but along the way began to understand some of the challenge structurally that the body has, and then electromagnetically. Of course, there's emotional and spiritual challenges, and someone may come in with one or all. Right. And it's a matter of listening and trying to determine through listening and doing a careful examination what the underlying problems are and then instructing them how to go about correcting them. So um, what area, uh, you know, I mean, like that, that covers a lot, you know what I mean? But do you, uh, what area do you practice in as a doctor? You were trained as what kind of a doctor? I was, I was trained as a family physician. Okay. And I practiced traditional family medicine for about 25 years. Okay. And I was so frustrated with the inability to spend the time necessary to get to the root of the problem and correct it that I left my successful family practice in 1999. Okay. And since that time, I've limited my practice to consulting with people with challenges and uh, spending the time necessary to identify them and move forward. And I understand, uh, you know, what you say about that, because even, you know, my son's pediatrician, I mean, just, it, 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 it's the time, you know, they're buzzing in and out and in and out and in and out, uh, you know, um, so it doesn't give people the opportunity to really go in, in depth. Right. Like you said, uh, into I don't, normally I don't book people closer than an hour mm -hmm. for each. Right. Because it's amazing how many times uh, someone will come in, I'll listen to them, go through their history, exam, and then almost as an aside, as we're closing down the visit, that's when it comes that's out. That's when it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> and right. now we can deal with it. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think I'm very fortunate because, I, like I said, I think that's common. I saw that in a couple of doctors that were treating my mother when she was ill, and um, it was very frustrating, and I transferred her care to uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. And I mean, the level of care and the level of time that they spent was completely opposite from what she had been getting prior to that. And I had the same situation with the, the doctor that cares for my son, is that I think there, you know, there's, I don't know where that comes from. But there's, there's, there's a pressure to right. perform today. Right. Uh, we live in an age where there are uh, an ever dwindling number of mm -hmm. solo private practitioners. Right. It, we've I've, I've observed the corporatization of American medicine. Right. And uh, those giant edifices cost money to build and to run. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough to remember when the largest bank in the community, largest building in the community was the bank. Right. Now it's the hospital. Right. And there's tremendous pressure to mm -hmm. see large numbers of people uh, almost as a triage in order to identify those that qualify for a high dollar procedure. And it was awful because I mean, my mother was struggling with, you know, some serious issues. And I was, I mean, I think, it, you know, when you're healthy most of your life and you don't really have to do much in the medical mm -hmm. field, but when somebody becomes ill, and then you start to put through this like machine that does not seem very caring or cons you know like you say yeah. um, uh, you know it's it's amazing to hear 
you know, your experience as well as, like I say, some of the doctors I'm really blessed to have as a part of my own life that, that they just, they've kind of put their foot down like you have and found a way to say, no, this is not why I went yeah. into practice. I went into practice to serve people and to help them. And uh, If you can imagine being in a medical practice where each day uh, I would be seeing 30 to 40 people and I would be just simply getting their primary complaint, mm -hmm. doing a brief exam, writing out a prescription, right. but not really expecting in the most cases of ongoing illnesses like diabetes or arthritis for them to actually get better. Uh, just a downhill progression to now you're going to have to have your leg amputated, now you're going to have to knee replacement. and. It is so rewarding to have people come in to my office, spend some time with them, mm -hmm. do some immediate corrections, and have them actually say, I feel so much better, mm -hmm. before they walk out the door. Right, of course. And I would assume that's why you became a doctor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, let's, let's talk about that. Like, what was it? Like, do you remember how old you were and what inspired you to, to become a doctor? Uh, I don't know the total origin of it. I know my mother was ill when I was a child, mm -hmm. but uh, I can recall when we were given assignments in junior high to uh, write about a career or talk about a career. I already had said that I wanted to be a physician. That's there was a mystique about what went on behind the closed doors of the operating room and right. <laughs> the, right. that sort of thing. Right, that's wonderful. Well, the other reason that we're here is um, to talk about another gentleman who uh, is, is very passionate about um, you know helping people and making them feel um, you know, have a much better sense of well-being, you know, and health um, in their lives. Um, and Fred Van Lu, of course. And um, maybe you could just share uh, where did you first um, both come in contact with each other, yeah. and uh, what your experience was of him at the time. Well, I actually met Fred on the Chicago L back in 1997. We were both attending a conference there. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew him from his picture, but I never had met him. Right. And my wife and I were riding on one side, he was riding on the <laughs> other, and she poked me and she said, isn't that Fred Van Loo? <laughs> <laughs> and so we said hello. The and infamous Fred he, Van Loo, right? Yes, we met, met the famous man himself, and he was very gracious. And uh, we've, we've become very good friends, and we've worked with him continually now for however many years that is. Now, you've become good friends, and maybe you could just share, like, what is it about what Fred does that you, um, you know, that you appreciate as far as what he's bringing, you know, to the consumer, um, you know, to kind of help them, you know, in a different way, but similar to what you do. One of the major challenges that we're facing today is electromagnetic pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, there uh, <coughs> is a feeling on the part of most people that being bombarded with microwaves and radio waves and all of the uh, things that we're exposed to today right. is harmless, but nothing could be further from the truth. Exposure to that sort of radiation, and it is radiation, mm -hmm. is as damaging as exposure to radiation on the other end of the spectrum, the gamma rays and x-rays, but people have a disconnect. Uh, some of the things that happen, for example, being bombarded with microwaves looking for cell phones, the smart meters in our homes running 24 hours a day, is evidence has shown that it breaks down the protective barrier that prevents toxicity from getting into the brain. We know that exposure to that sort of radiation causes damage in DNA, which sets the stage for tumor development. And Fred is one of the few people who is on the cutting edge of prote uh, uh, providing protective devices, appliances, to deal with this crisis that we have. Let me 
ask you a question about this because I'm a mom and I have a young child mm -hmm. and you know of course a lot of the kids now have an iPod or you know they play with their parents iPad or you know and this goes on and on and on uh, or the video yeah. games or whatever the case may be and um, I mean there's these video games that they can take in the car and, and you know, on and on is that like what is that doing to their health aside from all of the stuff that we're dealing with with the cell phones and everything is it having the same you know damaging effect to children at a very susceptible it's having effects for some reason american medicine from a, a, a medical doctor standpoint does not recognize that the body is electromagnetic and that, that that electromagnetic interference and challenges can result in disease. Mm -hmm. It's strange because it's used every day in a diagnostic sense. If I had the my machine here, I could lie you down, right. hook you up, and do an electrocardiogram, tracing the electrical activity of your heart. Okay. We could put leads on your head, do an electroencephalogram, the electrical activity of your brain. Uh, could put you into an MRI, a magnetic resonance imager, looking at the magnetic nature of your body. And those things are taken for granted. But whenever someone says that the radiation that affects the body's electromagnetic system is potentially harmful, so that's ridiculous. That's voodoo. That's craziness. That's what is being said right now. Yes. And, you know, it's, I remember, um, I have lost, my mother passed away in 2000, but I remember, you know, it was really around the time where, like, everybody was getting a cell phone. And I, she had this intuition. I remember her telling me, you know, please don't use that too often. And, and you know, one of the things that uh, I've done is I, you know, because I, I just felt like that Bluetooth thing. You know, oh, I could yeah. see that was like, and people walk around with them yeah. all I, just day long. Sends chills up my spine. Yeah, and mine too. And so, I mean, I have, and I want to ask you this because I was told that if I had a long cord, I had heard from somebody who used to work, and I can't say, I'm not going to say, for one of the big companies that, like, the president of that company, which was a cell phone company, mm -hmm. had a long, you know, just the cord that goes in the phone, and he would put the phone on the other side of the car and put that little you know, earbud in his ear because he wouldn't even put the phone up to his head or have a Bluetooth on. And I, there was a person that used to work there and he said, if you intend to have more children or to you know, be around for the one you have, you should get that thing off your head. And does that help at all to have that cord? You know what I mean? Does that, you know, <coughs> if the wave is coming down, if the phone is a foot away from you, I mean, does that make a difference? Most people don't realize it, but within the package instructions from cell phone manufacturers, mm -hmm. it says don't hold this within so many inches of your body. Really? No one well, reads that. No, nobody reads it, but why is it there? Product they're liability. To protect themselves. Yeah, yeah. Because when things do show up down the road, and they will, right? Uh, then they've got protect. Well, we told you not to do this. But focusing only on a person's individual cell phone, individual iPad, individual computer misses the big picture. Point. Uh -huh. Because if Neil Armstrong had had a single, a single common cellular telephone with him when he went to the moon, it would have been picked up on Earth as the third most powerful source of electromagnetic radiation in the universe, third only to the uh, Sun and the Milky Way galaxy. Now, if you can imagine the effect on the body of every microwave looking for every cell phone in the northern hemisphere passing through us right now. Wow. It's extreme. Extreme. So it's, it's so daunting because it makes me feel like this has all happened in the last five to ten years. So like the the rapid rate with which we're being exposed compared to what we were 10 years is just got to be enormous. And we don't know the effect <coughs> of what this is having on our bodies, correct? The, the challenge is we You're do... scary. <coughs> yeah, I, we want to get to the solution here pretty okay. soon, but it's important to have this discussion, no. you know? The, the realistic and the sad thing is we know what it's doing to oh, our do bodies. Know. We know the mechanism of what's going on. Let me put it into perspective. For the uh, average person. For the average person. You know, okay. That is not 
educated like you are. I am I'm a huge advocate of looking at the mechanism of what's happening in the body. Mm -hmm. What's the mechanism by which disease develops? What's the mechanism by, what, by which what we do reverses it? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to the mid-1950s. People then were saying there's absolutely no risk from smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Physicians were advertising cigarettes. Now, if I'm looking at mechanism, and I say that inflammation is the initial phase of cancer development, I can look at that and say that inhaling hot noxious gases that burn the lining of the throat, bronchial tubes, and esophagus is going to cause inflammation. Mm -hmm. I can predict that somewhere down the road, right. not five years, probably not 10 years, but maybe 15, 20, 30 years down the road, we're going to see an epidemic of cancer in those regions. I didn't need to have a placebo-controlled medical study looking at 30 years experience to tell me what was going to happen. Right. We are today with long wave radiation. That's broadcast radio and TV waves. It's it, the smart meters in our homes. It's Wi-Fi in all sorts of establishments. Right. It's RDIF, uh, radio frequency ID identification, inventory systems in stores. It goes on and on and on. I don't need to wait 30 years to say what's going to happen because when we have breaks in DNA, which have been proven to occur within a short period of time uh, by exposure to a single cell phone, and we know that we're breaking down the protective barrier of the nervous system, I can tell you what's going to happen down the road as certainly as I could have told you in the 1950s what was going to happen from smoking cigarettes. Right, so, and here's what, so what's going to happen? I mean, I don't even want to ask, but I know it's important. The incidence of cancer, mm -hmm. the incidence of neurological diseases like Alzheimer's disease right. are going through the roof. Right. If we go back to mid-1950s, the risk of you developing cancer in your lifetime was 1 in 12. You know what it is today? What? It's approaching 1 in 2. Wow. Now, Dr. Robert Becker who is a pioneer in electromagnetic medicine mm -hmm. has, is on record as saying that we're going to go to a two to one incidence, meaning that every individual can expect to have two cancers during his or her lifetime. Oh my goodness. So in, in talking about um, you know, the fact that we are being exposed on a much higher level because of the advancement in technology, which has been amazing, um, but you know, again, like our quick fix society is maybe not looking at the long-term effects of that um you know maybe we can talk about um well i'd like to talk about whatever solution there might be for protection that people are not aware of and i know that you know that um you know fred van Lu's company has been really passionate um about some of the things that they're offering to the consumer to help them to a certain degree um, so maybe you can just, you know, talk about, um, you know, finish up talking about the aspects of the study that, that you said was done, that have been done and what we uh, can do. People should be aware, there was a study done through the Karolinska Institute in Sweden mm -hmm. several years ago. It was conducted by Dr. Johansson, who's a dermatologist, skin doctor, right. and Dr. Hallberg, who's a number cruncher, statistician. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johansson was interested in trying to determine why did the incidence in melanoma skin cancer take off in the mid-1950s, late 1950s. The standard explanation is people got, went out and started sunbathing more frequently. But there's a melanoma paradox. Melanomas don't usually occur on sun-exposed parts of the body. He said, this doesn't make any sense. So they said, what else happened in the mid-1950s? And it was when TV and FM radio started to take off. They went county by county in Sweden. Wherever an FM TV station came online, incidence of melanoma went up. Wow. If it failed, went back down. They looked at other countries, found the exact same association. And it's so significant that they determined that exposure to broadcast waves mm -hmm. is a greater risk factor for the development of lung cancer than cigarette smoking. Really? If you look at where the FM waves 
TV waves hit the body, when we say waves, they, they're waves. Okay. Where they hit the body is an, a, a perfect match for where the melanoma cancers occur. Which is where? On the trunk of the body. Okay, wow, that's fascinating. Okay, so this is all very, um, you know, I mean, I know people want to bury their head in the sand and not listen to all of this, you know, because it's painful to listen yeah. to, especially like for somebody like myself, I have a young child, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I certainly intend to be around for a while, but, you know, you just think, what are we doing to the next generation and what are the effects going to be on their, or the quality of their lives as a result of this amazing technology that we have? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about at least some of the simple solutions like, for instance, example that e-water is providing to a consumer to try to protect themselves from some of the effects right. of cell phones and, and whatnot. Right. I've worked with Fred on this from the beginning, mm -hmm. and we've gone through many generations of protective devices. Mm -hmm. the, as the technology advances, for example, now with the installation of smart meters on our homes, it becomes an ever greater challenge. Uh, but the state of the, the thing that I want people to understand is Fred is constantly checking devices and keeping abreast of what is the latest technology. And if something better comes out than what's being offered through eWater, he's going to change. He's not tied to this is our technology and we're going to stick right. with it. Right now, there are two things that are really state of the art for personal protection. One is a little E dot, mm -hmm. which is just a small dot that's placed on a phone, an iPad, iPod, and it helps to negate some of the radiation that's going from that device. But the other is called. Can, a, can you just stop for a second? How does a little dot that's placed on a phone do something like that? Because I know, I mean, I'm sure that people watching us are going, yeah, right. Very, I very mean, well. You know what I mean? But how does, the, I mean... I'm I, not being facetious. I know I, you're not. I know I, you're not. I, I know that people are going, well, how would that, aff I, mean, it, I, mean, is there, I mean, is there a simple answer that you can explain that's not yes. too scientific that I, I can't can, understand? <laughs> I, can I can only explain it from a medical standpoint. Okay. Okay. I am not an engineer. I'm not right. a physicist. Right. I can't tell you how they put those things together. But I do understand the human body. Right. For example, if you'll humor me for a second, mm -hmm. if I ask you to hold your arm steady and not let it move, as I start to apply pressure, it locks up. Right. It's, a, it's a muscle reflex. You don't even need to think right, about it. Right, because I just it's, immediately... It, it immediately locks up. Right. Unless I short you out, in which case you can't make it lock up no matter how hard you try. Yeah. That's supposed to happen. That's sort of a that universal. Was not planned, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of a universal short. I expect that to happen. Uh huh. However, you shouldn't just short out for no reason. So, yeah, I, I, I can take someone mm -hmm. and say, "Hold your arm steady." Right. You've got a good lock. Your reflex is functioning. Mm -hmm. Now take your cell phone. Put it up to your ear. Yeah. Their reflex is gone. It mm -hmm. has affected their body's electromagnetic system. Mm -hmm. And that cannot be beneficial. It can only be harmful. Now, when we put the E dot onto the phone, hold it up to their ear, the reflex remains constant. Okay. So from a medical standpoint, right. I know what's happening to the body. Right. And that's what I care about. Right. I don't care how they do it. Yeah. I just care that, that they do works. do it. That it works, exactly. Because um, that's the most important thing that it works. Okay, so and then let, there was another thing that you were going to. The, the second thing is called about. an EP2 pendant. Okay. Now, uh, give you my simplified explanation of it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're here in Dallas. I don't have any clue how many radio TV stations there are. Multiple. But if we had a uh, tuner here, if we tuned in a station, we would hear it, and it would drown out all the other stations, sounds, wherever they may be. Now, back in 1915, a physicist named William Bragg won the Nobel Prize in Physics for determining a formula telling us what sort of glass crystal matrix will amplify what frequencies of energy. The EP2 is put together specifically to amplify energies of frequency the body uses for healing. And then the body can choose how much of each frequency it wants. But at the same time, 
it in essence just like that radio tuner that's tuning in the station we want and drowning out any other waves uh -huh. it's tuning in the frequencies we want and shielding us from the damaging ones oh, that's a wonderful analogy and, and I think that that helps a lot because um, I think people don't have they have they're very confused and very skeptical about this EP2 pendant and how is that gonna either help me or protect yeah, me from it's, anything. There's nothing magical about it. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, a law of physics. Okay. When waves come through it on this side, these are gonna come out the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a magic crystal. There's no healing power in the crystal. The body does all the protecting and the healing but the amplification of those selected frequencies of electromagnetic energy allow the body to do its job. That's a wonderful explanation, and thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. and I think a lot of people that are watching us appreciate hearing it in that way. And like I said, it's, it's a powerful analogy. And it, I'm a visual person, so it kind of helps me you know, to have yeah. that visual understanding. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, a lot of people that are, you know, watching us right now, again, they, you know, they're getting to know you right now, but they've maybe only seen, um, and as one of your colleagues and business associates and whatnot, they've seen Fred on a stage, or they've seen him in a video, or they've seen him in an interview, or whatever the case may be, but they've never met him. Mm -hmm. um, they don't live in this area of the country, or whatnot, and, you know, for people that are thinking about, um, making some changes in their lives and bringing in some of the different products or educational opportunities that he provides. Maybe you could just tell a little bit about, you know, who you know Fred to be as a person, mm -hmm. not just as a business professional or whatnot, but just, you know, the person that he is. Yeah, Fred is genuine. Yeah, Fred is Fred. Uh, he, he's dynamic. Uh, he's enthusiastic. But that doesn't change just because he's on a stage or whether he's in his office. Okay. He's his same bubbly self, uh, no matter where he is. He doesn't get up on stage and put on an act. Uh, it, it's, Fred is not an individual. He's back in the green room backstage, and now it's showtime, and I put on my act yeah. for people. No, he's Fred. And uh, to me, that I'm intending that as a compliment. Yes that he is, I know that he's going to be honest with me. And as I say, if, if he finds something that is better than what he's recommended in the past, he's going to change his recommendation. He's not going to say, I've got a stock here of $100,000 in EP2s. We need to clean those out before we move into another technology. No, he's, he's committed and that to means do everything if that's another technology comes around that's better than the EB2, right. what we're saying. Right, right now there's not. Right. But if there were, mm -hmm. he would change on a dime and right. say, this is the next generation. Right, and just move immediately, you know, into that next thing. And, I, you know, and again, I, I think that, I know when um, I first met him, I mean, he's an incredibly passionate individual. I had absolutely no understanding of what, he did or why it worked you know but I think that you do feel I mean there's such a genuine passion that he has for um, helping people to operate at a higher level of health and well-being and uh, the commitment that he has you know to his clients and you know his customers is, is <coughs> Fred doesn't limit himself to his products right a number of years ago I had a very painful joint in my low back mm -hmm. And we were, my wife and I were coming through Dallas, and we stopped at E Water to pick up some uh, product. Mm -hmm. And Fred saw that I wasn't walking normally. Right. He said, "Come here." And he tapped a few places on my back. Mm -hmm. Never came close to that sore joint, but the pain was immediately gone. Right. And I said, "I need to learn this." <laughs> and so Fred was instrumental in taking me to another level of working with people to resolve their underlying problems. And now I incorporate that energetic technique into my work with people every day. And did you learn that through the BSA um, training, or did he just individually teach it? No, he didn't individually teach it. I've gone to m uh, multiple workshops over the years, mm -hmm. and just 
every time I go back, it something else jumps out at me. Right. I wasn't doing that technique exactly right. Fortunately, the body's very forgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always learn something, whether it's a basic or step two or advanced. Uh, I, so I, I make a point of coming back at least a couple of times a year to stay abreast of what's happening. That's wonderful. And I, it's, it's one of the things that I really appreciate about what you're saying is as somebody who's, you know, been a professional, you know, and obviously has a, a tremendous commitment to the integrity of what you do. I mean, I think the thing that's most comforting to me, you know, is knowing that you are always searching for, you know, the most effective um, methods that you can use to serve people and to heal people. And I think what's most scary is people think they've got it all together, mm. no matter what age they are, you know, especially a professional and in the medical profession um, even more so, and are not out there, you know, continuing mm. to learn and grow. Well, back in the early 90s, I, I was hit with a number of personal health challenges. Mm -hmm. And I quickly learned that what I'd been taught to do didn't work. Right. I just felt worse on the medication. Right. And so I began stepping outside of the straight medical textbooks that are in journals and I started reading what people like Linus Pauling had written about vitamin C and what other people were saying about vitamin E, selenium right. and so on. And uh, amazingly to me, because I had always been taught that nutritional supplements were a waste of money. <laughs> uh, first time I walked into a health food store I can only liken it to the experience of a Southern Baptist evangelist walking into a liquor store. <laughs> But uh, amazingly, I started feeling better. Right. And I said, "Wow! If what I'm doing w with this little bit can it's help, yeah. what else is out there I don't yeah. know about?" Right. And I, I said a little prayer. I said, "God, if you will show me what's available, mm -hmm. I will look at anything and everything, no matter how strange it sounds <laughs> to my medically trained ears." Right. And if I can be assured of two things: number one. If to my satisfaction, given my medical background, I can identify a reason, a mechanism why this legitimately right. is helpful, and number two, I can assure myself that I can't hurt anybody, mm -hmm. I'll make it available. And that, I think that just that description of how you've made the decisions that you've made now, I mean, really means a lot because, um, like I say, I know in my own experience with my mother, um, the doctors that were theoretically caring for her that really took her out um, with old techniques. I mean, they are the ones that that I know robbed her of me. And I, you know, I had a medical malpractice suit all over the place. And and I, and 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 I, I remember at the time that it all happened. Like I know they were not willing to um, own that and at least say, wow, I need to look at this and see how I can never let this happen again because of the fear of lawsuits and whatever. But it was so frightening to me because there was no, there was, there was no learning experience. You know what I mean? And, and I thought, well, who are they going to do this to next? You know? the, the learning experience is, has almost disappeared from American medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the thing that was most painful, aside from the fact that I lost my mom as a result of some bad medical attention. I understand they're human beings, and I don't think they woke up that morning to make a bad decision to hurt my mother. But I think it was the reaction to not like owning it, you know. And I understand you're not going to because I don't want a lawsuit. But well, you know, I never had any comfort that that they had learned anything from or cared. You know, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> I could I could point to two individuals who died unnecessarily because physicians completely ignored what's called a black box warning. Mm -hmm. It is the most uh, dire warning that the FDA requires a drug manufacturer to put on their drug. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, don't do this, this is going to happen. And in both instances, the physician completely ignored the black box warning. Mm -hmm. And both people died. And nothing came of it because they simply said, we did the best we knew how to do. 
they didn't learn from it, as you say. They, right. they didn't say, oh, I should have recognized that mm -hmm. this drug would do what it did when the warning is right there. Well, in my situation, there was no communication between two different doctors, and I found out later I was told that yeah, that was a uh, contraindicate. I don't remember the term now. I, I had it all in my head. You know, this was in 2000, but the, the, the drug that they administered to her that knocked out her kidney function, you know, mm -hmm. in error, which then exacerbated the myeloma that she was carrying. I mean, my mother was completely asymptomatic. She had no mm -hmm. symptoms. And, and so I, I will say that I just, I, uh, anyway, on the higher level, I just appreciate what you're saying because I think that that's, you know, we're all doing the best we can, you know, but I, you know, I think it's gotten to be so problematic when, you know, people in whatever profession aren't constantly le learning and striving to become better and admitting we don't, ha we don't have all the answers, you know? So... Um, well, the beginning of knowledge is to recognize that I don't know what I don't know. Right. And unfortunately, and I understand the psychology of this because I came out of it personally. Right. If you take an individual who's invested 11 to 15 years post high school mm -hmm. before they e ever go to work in a right. actual clinical se private setting mm -hmm. and they've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in that education to suggest to them there's anything about what you're doing that you don't know is right. very threatening. Yes. And yet, I have learned so much through the years just by listening to what people have said. Right. A lot of people come through and suggest things that I look at and say, no, that, <laughs> I, I can't go there. Right. But on the other hand, I'm always listening to what people suggest. I know you had just mentioned, um, you know, that you had been traveling through Dallas <clears> and stopped by the office to pick up some product. And I know that you've had some personal experience with the different, you know, products that you have used. And, I, you know, I assume that you and your wife have incorporated into your lives. Maybe you can just share what your experience of them have been personally. Well, uh, just one experience is with the shower filter. Mm. Uh, mm. Prior to meeting Fred, no one had ever suggested to us that we should have a filter on our shower. Right. But my wife, Rosalie, uh, had, was constantly breaking out with red, dry spots on her skin. Mm -hmm. Had been that way for uh, 20 years or more. And when we put in the shower filter, she took her first shower and she said, it doesn't feel like pins and needles. <laughs> she then thought back and recognized that when she first got that sensation and her skin started to break out was when she left the farm when she, where they were on well water and moved to the city wow. where the water was chlorinated and she was sensitive to the chlorine, chlorine. that was in there. Uh, just putting on... Whatever else, right? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that was, I was at a meeting one year and I was having dinner and Fred Van Lee was sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. And someone across the table asked him, why do you recommend a shower filter? I don't get it. Right. He turned to me and he said, Dale, don't doctors sometimes prescribe drugs as patches? I said, yes. He said, how big are the patches? I said, maybe a dime, maybe a quarter. He said, you mean to tell me that you can put enough medication in that to last a whole day? I said, yeah, a whole week. He said, when you get into a shower and it's warm and your pores open up, mm -hmm. you can absorb more toxins through the skin in one brief five, ten minute shower than you could possibly drink in contaminated water all day long. Wow. And it made perfect sense. Yes. And so maybe you can tell me the results of what's happened to your, your wife um, well, since her, using her skin problem cleared up, yeah. and she's done great wow. ever since. And that's amazing that she had struggled with that for, you said, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then as the result of using this um, shower filter to take the chemicals out, how long did it take for it to all clear up? Do you uh, just a matter of uh, a week or so. Oh, my goodness. And that's just, that's just so incredible you know that, that people just don't even think you know yeah. that it's such a simple solution right right that's wonderful we've okay. talked about the electromagnetic pollution there's another aspect of it and that is that the earth's electromagnetic field is not uniform mm -hmm. it's in a series of grid patterns and where grid lines intersect the energy is very low for years my lungs were weak if i started getting a cold it went immediately to bronchitis 
Uh, twice I had pneumonia, once I had pleurisy. I couldn't understand it because otherwise I was doing well. Right. Uh, Rosalie's legs ached constantly every night. And when we began to understand <coughs> what was going on with the electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. we did some checking. Where my chest was, was a low energy zone. Where her legs were, where it was a low energy zone. <coughs> when we implicated, or when we brought in one of the whole house electromagnetic corrected mm -hmm. corrections, I've not had lung problems since. Wow. And she, her legs haven't hurt. Oh, that's amazing. That's incredible. Well, um, one of the things I just wanted to ask you as we kind of wrap up our interview is I think that, you know, for the people that are watching us that um, maybe are looking at this for the first time, they don't know you, they don't know Fred Van Loo, they don't know me, um, <coughs> and they're a bit skeptical but interested, um, what would you say to that person who's thinking about maybe getting a fill like when I hear you talk about the filter I'm like well why wouldn't you get it after listening to that um, but if they're thinking about incorporating a, a whole house system or a shower filter into their lives or any of the products or services that eWater provides what would you say to that person that's feeling still a little skeptical well the major nutrient as it is as if we want to call it that in the human body is water mm -hmm. we're mostly water and it's critical to be putting pure water into the body uh, there was a big flap a few years ago, and it still comes up that uh, bottled water is just tap water. Mm -hmm. Well, by that form of logic, tap water is sewer water. Mm -hmm. It's just how much purification do you want done? Uh, every quarter, I get a printout from my city listing all of the chemicals that are in the water, right. and they pat themselves on the back saying that these are within the EPA guidelines. I'm of the opinion that a little bit of poison on a daily basis is not a good idea over the course of your lifetime. And they send that to you and people open it and they just throw it in the trash mm. like it's junk mail. They probably don't, they don't even look at it, right? But, but we're locked into what's been called the science of the immediate experience. Mm -hmm. If I eat something, if I do something, and I don't collapse and die within the next week, it's okay. Right. But we've got to start thinking long term. We've got to start thinking decades, not days. Right, and that's just short term thinking as opposed to long term. Because if we think about it on a generational level, you know, uh, which a lot of people don't anymore, and you know, it makes a huge difference. Especially think about your children, your grandchildren, their children. You know, we do, and I agree with you. We have a, a responsibility to, to take the actions today. To, you know, how that's going to affect future, probably, future generations to come. Probably the best way to sum things up is it is my humble opinion that suicide is just as deadly if committed by a society mm -hmm. as by an individual. We're committing suicide as a society with what we're doing with our food, our water, electromagnetic right. pollution. At least do what you can as an individual, as a family to not be part of that societal suicide. And collectively, we can make some changes. Yes. So thank you, doctor, so much, so much for spending this valuable time with us. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome.